Afternoon tea parties are extremely popular here in the UK, so let me show you how I make mine for you to enjoy at home. Let's begin by making this stunning pork and apple sausage roll. Begin by placing 400 grams of sausage meat into a mixing bowl, and then place a frying pan over medium heat. Toast two grams of fennel seeds until they begin to release their beautiful aroma. Take immediately from the heat and place it into a mortar and pestle to give them a crush. If you don't have a mortar and pestle, just place them onto a chopping board and run a knife through them to break them up. Next, cut one Granny Smith apple into small dice. Peel and grate one clove of garlic on a microplane. And finally chop five grams of flat leaf parsley. Add all of those ingredients into the sausage meat. And if the sausage meat isn't already seasoned, season it with a pinch of salt and pepper. Mine is already seasoned, but I'm just adding a few cracks of black pepper just to give it that little spicy touch. Mix all of the ingredients together until well combined. You can do this just using a spoon, but I find it easier to get your hands in there and give it a good mix. Place the mixture into a piping bag and you can store this in the fridge until you're ready to use it. Roll out one pack of shop-bought ready-rolled puff pastry and brush it all over with egg yolk. Next, cut the end off your piping bag, making sure it's roughly around an inch open in size, and then pipe the sausage meat into the center of the pastry all the way along until you've used all of the mixture up. Leave a small overhang at each end to allow for shrinkage when it's cooking. Now fold the pastry over the sausage meat and press it firmly on the other side. I like to leave the parchment paper that the pastry comes in on at this stage because it helps get a nice smooth finish when you're folding it over and pressing it down. Peel the paper back and then just use a fork to press along the edge to make sure you've got a nice tight seal. Trim off the excess pastry. Next, brush the pastry all over with more egg yolk, making sure it's a nice even layer. You don't want to put it on too thick because we're going to do a double glaze on this. After the first glaze, place it in the fridge if you can, or if not, just leave it on the countertop for roughly around five to 10 minutes until the yolk goes a little bit tacky and starts to set. At that stage, brush it one more time with egg yolk to get a nice rich dark color on your sausage roll. At this point, you can score the pastry if you like, but you don't have to, this is just optional. But one important note is to make sure you're not cutting all the way through the pastry. You literally almost just want to score the glaze, not the pastry itself. You can do this in any pattern you like. Before placing it in the oven, I like to sprinkle mine with a few onion seeds and a few sea salt flakes. Place it into a preheated oven at 170 degrees Celsius fan for 25 to 30 minutes until nice and golden on top and completely cooked through. Once it's baked, leave it to cool on a cooling rack before portioning it up into your desired size. I've cut them into two inch pieces, roughly getting eight sausage rolls out of this one, or you can eat it whole like this. Next up, we're gonna make sweet scones with clotted cream and jam. Place into a mixing bowl 250 grams of self-raising flour, 40 grams of caster sugar, half a teaspoon of baking powder, and 65 grams of cold, diced, unsalted butter. Rub the butter into the flour mixture using your fingers and thumbs until it resembles a breadcrumb-like consistency. Make a well in the center and crack in one egg. Add a splash of milk and then mix the ingredients together to bind. You may need to add a little bit more milk, but just do this gradually, a little splash at a time, because you don't want the mixture too wet. You just want to add enough until the mixture comes together. Once the mixture forms a dough, set it to one side and lightly flour a workbench. Place the dough onto it and then lightly flour a little bit on top. Roll the dough out using a rolling pin until it's one and a half to two inches thick and then cut out using a cookie cutter of your choice. I'm using a nice small one and this one will get me roughly around nine scones, but you can do larger ones if you prefer. An important tip when cutting is to dip your cutter into some flour first. This just stops it from sticking. And then when you press down, make sure that you press it evenly. So not so it's one side goes in first, make sure it goes down all straight at the same time. This helps create nice strands at the side that will help it rise evenly in the oven. Place the cutout scones onto a baking tray lined with parchment paper. 
Cover them with a clean tea towel and leave them to rest for 20 minutes. Before placing them into the oven, glaze the tops with some beaten egg and then sprinkle with a little bit of caster sugar. Place them into a preheated oven at 170 degrees Celsius fan for 18 to 20 minutes. Leave the scones to cool on a cooling rack before cutting in half and finishing them with some clotted cream and strawberry jam. Let me know, do you put the cream first or the jam? I'm not too sure. And then if you like, you can finish them with some fresh strawberries. Now here's one for the chocolate lovers, salted caramel and chocolate pops. We are going to begin by making the salted caramel. For that, place a heavy bottom saucepan over medium heat and add in 170 grams of caster sugar, followed by 70 milliliters of water. Heat it up until the sugar dissolves and leave it to bubble away. It's important here not to stir it. If you stir the caramel at this stage, it will crystallize. And at that point, it's hard to bring back. If you do need to mix it slightly, just swirl the pan, but don't get in there with a spoon and mix it. Leave it undisturbed until you can see it change color to a nice light amber color. At that stage, add in 160 milliliters of double cream. Stir until the cream and sugar combine into a beautiful caramel, and then take off the heat and add in 50 grams of diced unsalted butter and stir that in until the butter has melted. Finally, finish it with a nice pinch of sea salt and you've got a beautiful salted caramel. Transfer it into a bowl and leave it to the side to cool. Next, we need to make a chocolate ganache. For that, place another saucepan over medium-low heat and add in 150 ml of double cream. Gently warm the cream through until it's hot to the touch, but not boiling, and then add in 100 grams of good quality dark chocolate. Stir until the chocolate melts and you've got a beautiful chocolate sauce, and then stir in 5 ml of vanilla extract and 20 grams of unsalted butter. Transfer it into a bowl and leave it to cool. And finally, to finish this dessert, we're gonna make a chocolate crumb or known as a chocolate soil. And this is just gonna add a lovely bit of crunch to these chocolate pots. Place another saucepan over medium heat and add in 100 grams of caster sugar and 40 ml of cold water. And just like the caramel, you need to heat this until the sugar dissolves. Remembering not to stir this one as well. Keep heating it until it just starts to go amber around the edges. And then we're gonna add in 75 grams of finely chopped dark chocolate. And this is where it gets interesting. You'll think that it's not gonna work, but trust me it will. And go straight in with a whisk and coat that chocolate in the melted sugar mixture. It will start to come together and you think it might not work, but a certain reaction happens where suddenly it breaks down into a chocolatey powder. This is really quite fun to make. As soon as that happens, transfer it onto a plate or a piece of parchment paper and leave it to one side to cool before we assemble our chocolate pots. To assemble, begin by placing some of the chocolate soil into the bottom of the glasses and then layer it up with caramel and the chocolate mixture in as many layers as you like. And if you fancy, you can put some of the chocolate soil in between as well. Once the glasses are full, you can just finish the top with a bit more of that chocolate soil. Place them in the fridge to set until you're ready to serve them. You can do these in small shot glasses or, or larger glasses if you prefer, but I wouldn't fill the large glasses up because it is quite a rich dessert and better to eat in smaller portions. Next up, we're gonna make some individual three layer spiced carrot cake with mascarpone frosting. We're gonna begin this recipe by peeling and removing the ends of 280 grams of carrot. And then we're gonna grate them on the large side of a box grater. Next, take 150 grams of dried fruit of your choice. I've got a mixture of raisins and dried cranberries here. And then just run your knife through them to break them up and make them a little bit smaller. And then do the same again with 80 grams of walnuts. Next, place 180 grams of light brown sugar into the bowl of a stand mixer, along with three whole eggs. And then using the whisk attachment, we're gonna whisk them until they are light and fluffy. You can use a hand mixer to do this. Now add in the grated carrot and mix that through using a beater attachment. Next, we need to add the dry ingredients into the carrot, sugar and egg mixture. So that is 190 grams of self-raising flour, 40 grams of ground almonds, half a teaspoon of ground cinnamon, 
one teaspoon of mixed spice, two teaspoons of baking powder, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Mix it again until the ingredients are fully incorporated and you've got a lovely cake batter. Then add in the chopped dried fruit, keeping a little bit back for decoration at the end, and doing exactly the same with the walnuts. Fold them through the batter until they are mixed through. Now line a baking sheet with parchment paper and then spread out the cake batter until it fills the full sheet. Bake in a preheated oven at 160 degrees Celsius fan for 30 minutes or until a skewer or knife comes out clean. Remove from the oven and place onto a cooling rack to cool. For the mascarpone frosting, simply place 110 grams of icing sugar into the bowl of a stand mixer and add in 500 grams of mascarpone cheese and five milliliters of vanilla extract. Using the whisk attachment again, beat the mixture until it just holds its shape. It'll only take two to three minutes to get to this stage. Place the frosting into a piping bag and into the fridge until you're ready to use it. Next, using a cookie cutter, cut out discs of the carrot cake. If you want to reduce the wastage and maybe get a few more out of it, you can cut it into squares, but I like the look of them when they are round. With the leftover cake bits, I just bag them up and I place them into the freezer. Because they're great to mix through ice cream or use them for other desserts if you fancy. To assemble the cakes, take three discs and then pipe onto each one the mascarpone frosting. Do this however you feel comfortable. And if you're not comfortable piping, you can just spoon it on or spread it out with a palette knife. It's entirely up to you. But I'm using a piping bag and I'm just doing nice little dots all the way around until I fill the surface area of each disc. And then we're just gonna stack them on top of each other and then sprinkle them with a little bit of the chopped dried fruit. And then I like to grate over a little bit of walnut using a microplane. You can of course just add over chopped walnuts, but I think it looks really nice when it's grated. Now for the final sweet treat of this afternoon tea, we're gonna make some stunning lemon meringue tarts. Let's begin by making the sweet pastry. Place 150 grams of plain flour into a mixing bowl with 75 grams of unsalted butter and rub it between your fingers and thumbs until it forms a breadcrumb-like consistency. Then stir through 50 grams of icing sugar and add in one egg yolk. Mix it through and if you need a little bit more liquid to bind it together, add in a few drops of cold water. But just do this gradually because you don't want the mixture too wet. Mix it until you can just press it together to form a pastry. Wrap it in parchment paper or cling film and place it in the fridge to firm up for 20 minutes to half an hour. Now we need to make a zesty lemon curd. And for this, we need to place one whole egg and one egg yolk into a heat proof mixing bowl. And then add in 50 grams of caster sugar and 50 milliliters of freshly squeezed lemon juice. Whisk the ingredients together and then place a saucepan with a little bit of water in over medium heat and bring it to a simmer. Turn the heat to low and then place the lemon and egg mixture over the pan, making sure that the water does not touch the bottom of the bowl. You need to keep whisking the mixture until it becomes foamy and thick. Make sure that you're constantly whisking it because you don't want the eggs to scramble. As soon as the mixture starts to become thick, take it off the heat. And then we're gonna whisk in 40 grams of diced unsalted butter. To finish it, just squeeze in another few drops of freshly squeezed lemon juice. Whisk it in and transfer it into a bowl to cool. Place a piece of parchment paper or cling film over the top and just press it to the surface of the lemon curd. This stops the skin forming when it cools in the fridge. Now the lemon curd is cooling in the fridge, we can start to make our tart shells from the pastry that we made earlier on. Lightly flour a workbench and place the pastry onto it. And then just gradually roll it out until it's as thin as you can possibly get it. Roughly around one to two millimeters in thickness if you can. A good tip here is after every single roll, turn the pastry slightly just to make sure it's not sticking when you're rolling it out. Next, cut the pastry out into round discs using a cookie cutter, making sure it's larger than the tart shell tins that you're going to use. And then press the pastry into each tart tin, making sure you're getting it right down into the corners and firmly pressing it around the edges. Leave the overhanging pastry on while we place them in the fridge to rest for a further 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, using a fork, prick the bottom of the tart shells. This just stops it from bubbling up when it's baking. And then trim off the excess pastry around the top using a paring knife. 
Next, press a piece of parchment paper into each pastry case, and then I'm just topping them up with a little bit of rice. This is to use in place of bacon beans. The rice is small enough just to get into the edges and hold it down while the tart shells are blind baking in the oven. Place into a preheated oven at 160 degrees Celsius fan for 15 minutes. And then after 15 minutes, remove the rice and bake for a further 10 minutes until the shells are lightly golden. Remove from the oven and leave them to cool. Once cool, they should just pop straight out of the tins. And finally, we're gonna make an Italian meringue. For that, place 200 grams of caster sugar and 60 milliliters of water into a heavy bottom saucepan. Place it over medium heat and heat until the sugar dissolves, remembering not to stir while we do this. Place in a sugar thermometer and heat it until it reaches soft ball stage, which is around 115 degrees Celsius. As soon as it reaches that point, take it off the heat. Next, make sure that the bowl of your stand mixer is super clean. I like to squeeze in a few drops of lemon juice and then just rub it around using kitchen towel just to make sure we get rid of any grease or anything that might be there to stop the egg whites from rising fully when we whisk them. Then place in two egg whites and whisk until they're nice and stiff. Leave the mixer running and slowly pour in the sugar mixture until it's fully incorporated. By this point, you should have a beautifully glossy marshmallow-like meringue that holds its shape. Place the meringue into a piping bag and into the fridge until you're ready to use it. To assemble the lemon tarts, I've also placed the lemon curd into a piping bag, but you can just spoon it in if you want to, and then go around each tart shell, filling it halfway with the lemon curd. Next, take the Italian meringue and then just pipe it on top in one nice dollop, trying to get that nice peak on the top. This may take a little bit of practice, but you'll get there in the end. Finally, I'm just gonna to torch the meringue until it's nice and golden using a blowtorch. If you don't have a blowtorch, you could just place them under the grill for a couple of minutes until they just start to go golden brown, or you can just leave the meringue as it is. And of course, you can't have an afternoon tea without some beautiful afternoon tea sandwiches. For mine, I've kept it nice and simple with some classic combinations. I've gone for smoked salmon and cream cheese, ham and mustard, and then cheese and chutney. But I'll also put a list of other classic afternoon tea sandwiches that you can give a go yourself at home. Now classically, these sandwiches are cut into fingers or triangles, and of course, the crusts are cut off. And I don't know what it is, there's something special about eating these sandwiches without the crusts. Now that completes our afternoon tea and all that's left to do is stack them up onto an afternoon tea stand or onto individual boards and plates and then go and enjoy them with your friends and family because that's what it's all about. I hope you have as much fun making this afternoon tea as I did and you can enjoy sharing it with your friends and family. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. It's all mine. <laughs>